Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast, co-starring 10-year NBA center Ryan Hollins. Couple pump fakes, leads it, shot blocked by Ryan Hollins. Hollins sent that into the third row. Six rebounds and eight assists. Oh! Hollins climbs the stairs. Down the floor. Ryan oh! Hollins, he is the high jumper. That's what I want to see. Give me some gunpowder and throw the hammer down. And now, here is your host, Let's send it over to Rick Buker. Rick Buker. Welcome to another episode of Buker and Holland, subsidiary of Buker and Friends, part of the United Wecast Network. I'm Rick Buker. You can see me on FS1. You can read me on Bleach Report. You can follow me on Twitter at Rick Buker and on Instagram at Rick underscore Buker. He is Ryan Hollins. You can see him on ESPN. You can follow him on uh, Twitter at the Ryan Hollins and on Instagram simply at Ryan Hollins. Feels like we have not done a show together for a while. We tried to do it last week. You were in Istanbul and then you were in Istanbul getting seasick. So, first of all, did you go to the bazaar? Did you buy any rugs? Did you buy any leather coats? What did you do <laughs> in Istanbul? I did go to the Grand Bazaar. Uh, there's no easy way to get there, by the way. And just so you know, the taxi drivers will try to drop you off short of getting there. Oh, is that right? It's like, it's one of those deals. And they don't really, there's, there's it's not a really English friendly country. So <laughs> I went there. They did try to sell me a rug. I did not get a rug. But <laughs> what I did get uh, was some fabric for a suit. Okay. I got some fabric for a suit, but I like, you know, like, it's not like, it's like, what do I want to get? Like my wife got a bunch of purses and stuff uh -huh. and like, it's a cool thing. But for me, it's like, I, I don't know what I want. Did you, did you haggle? Like. Did you bargain? Oh yeah. 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 We went $15 American dollars a square yard, okay. which is, which is pretty good. And, and where'd I, you start? I where'd you start that. out? Where'd they, where'd they start out at? He wanted 20. He wanted 20. Okay. So you worked. He wanted 15. 20. Okay. No. Did you now? Did you have some uh, what is it? Turkish coffee or Turkish tea? Did they did they do the whole like sit down? We got to talk this over. My wife got the tea. She oh, got the tea. Okay. She right. got the she got the back room and the tea, and then they, you know. In in all seriousness, did you get any any vibe being an American over there? Just because things have been kind of janky. Uh, uh, any? I, I've it's been a while since I've been over there. I was over there. Man, I was over there right before 9-11. So it tells, tells you how long it's been. Uh, and I don't know that I've been back since that I can think of. But d is there d is there any vibe? What's the vibe over there? My understanding, they were very um, American friendly. Uh, they didn't have problems. They're kind of like naturally rude, though. So I don't think it was specifically towards me. But there, there are. They're, they're really just kind of just rude. Just I, yeah, you know, like, like, you know, like kind of. I don't want to say the country swindlers because that would be a wrong thing. But there are a lot of people just trying to make their money they, they, uh, by any to get means over. necessary. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a there's a lot of people doing that. They're 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 quite fashionable. They got their skinny jeans on. There's a couple guys there that are you know. Did you did you run into our boy Hito Turkulu? No, that's my guy though. That's my guy. No, I missed him. Okay. All right. Um, so you were on vacation. How did you choose that to be your vacation spot? I didn't. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> my wife wanted to tag along with her parents on the family trip. Oh, okay. All right. Wasn't really, yeah, this wasn't my trip. I got you. I got you. <laughs> I, Say, I no Say no more. Say no more. Happy wife, happy life. I saw when I when I text you like, "Where are you, Istanbul?" <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh. So how did you get seasick? On top of everything else. So we went to this little island on a, on a ferry, and it's like three stops to get there. First time I'm on the way, I stay awake the whole time. I'm like, oh, this is cool, man. It's low key like. Uh, hour, hour and a half or more like ride, like to get to these three stops to get where we're going. And on the way back, I fell asleep and kind of nodded off. And that's the worst thing to do. Mm. And I believe because I fell asleep, just the left, right. I mean, 
Dude, when I say <laughs> this travel was not, there was no part of this trip that was luxurious. Like, what? just to get to the taxi, to the ferry, to the spot, and then once you got to the island, just everywhere you were, there's these these little islands, just the sun was just beating up on you and the weather, and then you mm. got back and went, oh, it, man, it did a number on me, bro. So you're happy to be back? Wouldn't call <laughs> this as a necessarily a vacation. <laughs> I'm, I'm good i'm glad say no more say okay. no more okay so uh speaking of another uh group that is traveling team usa is in china about to embark on the world cup competition they were in australia they uh they beat spain uh before leaving the u.s and i want to say they and then i don't know if they played them again over there but they then uh, no, they played them here and then they played Australia. Oh, they played Canada. That's, that's it. They played Canada in Australia and, uh, ended up going three and one beat Canada split against Australia, had their 78 game win streak broken. A lot of people made a big deal out of it, or at least people wrote about it as if it was a big deal. I didn't see it as a big deal. What about you? I, I don't either. Uh, not with this team. I, I think you'd actually rather lose in these type of tournaments in the exhibition games mm -hmm. rather than going in. It, it, you really get a sense of fool's gold going in and feeling like you're better than you are. Now, you don't want a loss. You want that loss like, hey, we're better than that. We know we're better versus we lost and, okay, let's time, let's wake up, guys. Yeah. Because I was a part of a team, the 19 and under team, that went uh, undefeated through – through three tournaments, won every exhibition game, lost the game before the the cup rounds, and <laughs> finished without a medal. Oof. That was my under nineteen team with you know D Brown, Paul Davis, Darren Darren Williams, JJ Reddick, and those guys. Okay. Then we lost to Lennis Claza. Bogut was on Australia with a couple other guys, and this is a young you know, Bogut. Yeah, yeah. Berea was in was in Puerto Rico. Yep. You know. And we we end up in fourth place with no medal. And then when I played in the Pan American Games, we end up Mark Few. <laughs> I'll say it now. I don't. I tell him to his face. Mark Few didn't know the difference between a professional and a college player because we mixed. And he thought sometimes college coaches they just think they know better because if you do my my strategy, hard right. show and this and that. Right. Well, it's basketball. Players go out and win games. Okay. And he played Caleb. Uh, was Nooski, what's what's Caleb's last name? That's my guy, too. Shout out Caleb, by the way. He played him over me, and at the time, Caleb's still in college. He's going back to a year of college. I'm going back to my ninth or tenth year in the NBA. Hmm. And just experience. That's when Jamal Murray went off on us, and they go, this Jamal Murray guy should be the number one pick in the NBA. Yeah, because he had a college kid guarding him on a pick and roll. Keep in mind, he was coming out of high school at the time, too. Wow. So that made it pretty impressive. But he had Caleb not showing out on pick and rolls or getting up because he didn't have the foot speed or the experience. And, man, Jamal Murray was wearing his butt out. And I'm like, yo, you may not appreciate me at face value, Mark Few, but there's a reason I play in the NBA because I'm not going to give up those buckets on a pick and roll. Yeah. We lost to Canada. Then he smartened up. We played the last game, and he kind of played me out. We got a, you know, we got a medal. But it, it, it's a fun experience, man. But it's a everything you know about basketball, Rick, you throw out the window and it's a game of details. Hmm. And I say everything, you know, because we don't play the game smart. We play the game by a different set of rules, but ultimately I'm bigger than you, stronger than you, faster than right. you. And I can make a move and score on you right. a contested shot and their run cut pass, yep. wide open shot layup or wide open shot three. So if you don't know that tempo of how to play, you will get beat. And then they'll step up and make a, a gutty one-on-one -on -one shot, you know, in, in a certain moment. So it's a completely different style. I just talked about that in my last solo podcast where I was saying that this is what I really enjoy about watching national team tryouts and practices is that you, you immediately get a sense of, who understands the nuances of the game, who understands how to play because the game, our game, the NBA game has become a really athletic game, a, a super athletic direct line game. 
and the net and the in the net and the international game is as you said it's far more detail oriented it's much more execution it's much more of a thinking man's game that's why you know i'm watching Derek white just be the best player in some of these uh practices and it was just he, he wasn't overwhelming guys he just saw the floor he could just make easy plays but he made easy play after easy play he just he he understood how to use space and um and angles and and that we just we have some guys who like it's a shock to their system when they can't they like, they're like looking at some of these international players and they can't overwhelm them physically because of the way that the international teams play and the way the games played and then they get frustrated and it's like okay I'm going to go even harder and it and it kind of backfires and so that's where like I appreciate the discovery when it comes to and I, and I think that it's well, like more of our young players should play in national competition because I think it would improve the NBA game. I think that the the overall IQ of players in in the league would improve if they got a taste of that early on rather than just using veteran players. So here, here's the question I have for you when it comes to that is is there are like there are advantages and there's exposure and there's politics and there's all sorts of things to be gained from playing in the national program above and beyond that you're just representing your country. Um, wh- where, where did it fall for you in terms of the value? Like, why did you do it? Why was it m- so meaningful to you? First time I actually didn't want to do it because I want to be at home in the summertime, but I didn't know what USA basketball was like, yo, Ryan Hollins, like, you barely made it to UCLA. You had some flashes of greatness and then half just potential. And then, you know, half the season you're on the bench with no numbers. So for you to be on USA basketball puts you in the top percentage of your class and essentially puts you in the NBA. I didn't realize that. And as I was playing, I don't know if you know this, Rick, but I went out of nowhere and I swear to God, I had no idea what this meant. I'm killing these guys are supposed to be number one picks in the draft or big picks like Bogut, Linus Klaza, uh, the Marcus Aldridge played up, you know, kind of played well against, against him. Like he didn't do anything like uh, J.R. Giddens, who played at Kansas at the time. All these guys were high. And I was killing these guys. And before long, I looked up and I was like, like, I don't know, just all the dust cleared. And I'm the starting center on USA basketball hmm. alongside with Paul Davis. And it's like, yo, what the heck is this? Hmm. And Afterwards, I was a late first rounder on the NBA draft boards, but I, I swear to God, I had no idea what it was. I didn't even want to go play. But, I, you know, at the, at the time, Rick, I only had one gear. But for a guy like me who could defend and was athletic, mm-hmm. where I'm used to seeing everybody who's athletic, mm-hmm. dude, if they had the film of some of those games, I had some dunks and some plays that were like unreal, hmm. like Play, and it was my fir- it was my first time playing with the, like a real point guard. Yeah, like D Brown and Darren Williams that would like drive the ball hard to defender, drop it off for a dunk yes. or throw a, a lob like a half court lob. Like, dude, I had so many dunks. I don't think you have any idea. See, I think that's one of the things that's probably been lost since all of the politics, uh, the you know the, the the controversy around Darren Williams. To me, Darren Williams was a guy who understood the game. Guy who understood so angles, good. right? And so and and knew how to organize a team. He, I was just gonna say, like, who who was it that was organizing you guys? Because you know, with the like, you could exploit it because of your athleticism and your length, and you knew how to play off of somebody. But you needed somebody who was orchestrating things in the international game. If you you couldn't just play up and down, you couldn't have just another running guard. You had to have somebody who was able to to uh, again you know sort of what i saw with with Derek white in in and i don't know how he's going to do in the international actual international competition although i think he's he's done well he and marcus smart have done well and the fact that those two only played nine minutes each against australia in the loss tells you that i think popovich was pulling a little euro game on the euros because they never show their hand in the exhibitions and i think he got a feel for what Marcus could do, what Derek could do. And he's like, I'm not going to show any more than I have to right now. Like, I'll let, I'll let 
other I guys. I think Kuzma play. didn't play too, right? Yeah, when Kuzma's out. So or well, at he, that time, yeah, maybe he had just got the injury. Yeah, he no, he didn't he didn't play in that game. He he um he was having an ankle issue. I I don't know where to put that. I I want to say based on everything they've said that he would have played and contributed. He made some egregious errors while I was watching him in training camp, but they are short. I mean, Brooke Lopez and and Mason Plumley are situational players on this team. That's why Miles Turner is playing so many minutes. I think I, I would think that just from a agility standpoint, they could use Kyle Kuzma as a big on this team. But we've seen so many times where they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They're not saying we we cut you. It's it's so and so wants to concentrate on next season, or so and so has got an ankle injury, Dang. or whatever it is, man. They, nobody's really nobody's nobody's coming right out. I mean, the first the, like Trey Young and some of the and, and uh, Bam Adebayo, like some of the early cuts. They just mm-hmm. came, you know, they just, they didn't make any excuses. Some of the later ones has been all about, Dang. like, Pull how, do it we, out, right? how do we let these guys down easy? De'Aaron Fox, right? De'Aaron Fox, yeah. De'Aaron Fox, step, he's, he, he had a chance to make the team, but he apparently didn't like his role. And because he only played six minutes in the Spain game and Derek White played, like, the whole second half, Right after that, he said he bowed out. Dang, and I gotta tell cats you, man, are doing that. And you know what? And I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like that, man. I said it in the previous. I, I do not like that, dude. Compete. If you if you lose out on the spot, look. Charles Barkley did, got cut from a from from a team, uh, from a national team. Go and compete. Yeah. Don't bail because you're not sure if you're going to make it or what your role is going to be. That's to me, that's bogus. That's that is a <laughs> and Bagley kind of did the same thing. Bagley was invited up from the select team, the same as Derek White. And again, I think they could have used I think they could have used Bagley. But hey. I don't know if those guys were like sold on and here's the thing in general too, I think where we are right now with the national team is we're back to there's no redeeming value. You're supposed to win. And if you don't win, then you suck. And so there's no, there's no, like we went through, we went through this after the dream team came out. And then I think we won 96, we won. And then it it was, you know, everybody was just, it was kind of a, a, a convoluted uh, all-star selection process. And, and we had, overseas teams with NBA players that were gunning for us and we were taking too casual an approach and we got our butts kicked a couple times. And so then it came down to the redeem team and now there was something to play for and everybody got together and you know, now, now it was, if you won, like you've re you've reestablished us and now it's back to, you're just, you're supposed to win. It's almost like where the warriors were at the end. Like if you, if you, if you win, then you did what you were supposed to do. And if you lose, well, then you suck. And and who wants to face that kind of like, there's no redeeming value in that. Because the reality is there's a good chance that you could lose. There's a good chance that this team could lose. And and that's why I give credit to the guys who have showed up. The guys who, like, people are bagging on this team. I'm like, why are you bagging on this team? These are the guys that are willing to play. Mm-hmm. Like, what what, knowing that they're, that the competi- that the bar is high and that the competition is stiff. Now you're going to you're going to oh these guys, you know, these guys are trash or whatever. It's like, no, if you want to bag on somebody, bag on the guys, bag on De'Aaron Fox, bag on, bag on Marvin Bagley, mm-hmm. bag on the guys who chose not to participate. Who needed this? And Those I would two say needed this. Uh and I'm with you on that. Like this I'm going to prepare for the upcoming season to get the Kings to the playoffs. Shut up. You got a month. Yeah, you got nah. a month after this ends, and you're telling me the experience against this competition in this kind of circumstance isn't going to make you a better player at this age. Yeah, it's whether I, whether I like it or not, every summer that I played competitively, whether it be like a pro am, college tournament, or you know USA basketball, I always came back that year and had a heck of a season. Yeah, All, always. Memphis, my last year, I felt like I played the best basketball of my career in that last year. Under 19 team, I came back and was, 
you know, doing some wild things um, every single time, even in, in college. So every summer, even the year before with the Clippers, I've won a, a, a Drew League championship. Hmm. And I that's when we had that year. We had the you know, year off the bench. But like you just come in like already sharp. Yeah. So uh, if you, you know, if you had still been playing for the big three championship, you probably wouldn't have had to go to in- Istanbul. N- no, I would not have. No, would I would have been not here. have. And you would have been playing for the aliens. I would have been here. Right. I would have been here. That is true. So with, with that in mind, what was the big three? This is, this is the second time you've done it. You were with an expansion team this year. What was the experience like? And, and would you do it again? Yeah, I'd never rule out uh, doing a big three again uh, if it fits. Um, I mean, I don't want to say easy money, but like for what we've known, or for where I'm still at health wise, it's it's like a like a no brainer. You you know what I'm saying? Uh, and I think beyond myself, it's an amazing opportunity where you can make somewhere around a hundred grand still staying in the states, and that's an overseas salary for you know pending on the level of player. Yeah. So it it really is a no brainer. And then. I mean, I don't even want to say a fraction of the time. That might be underplaying it. You, you, you know, you might have to be there for ten days. Let's make it twenty days versus being there for like nine months and making the same salary. So, right. it's it, it's nothing matches that. I remember the first year I played. I'm like, man, shoot, I darn near feel like I made this overseas and it stayed here. Like, like, dude, like I for real had to put together a financial plan. Like, well, shoot, I lost this much money overseas. This is what I played. Well, shoot, if I make half the money I made overseas in a big three, then go out and do some broadcasting. I'm I'm putting something together here. So yeah. and that, that that check is really helping guys out. So I hope the league, how it's doubled and grown, that that consistency stays there and all the little loose ends just get get tied up, man. And I mean, the, the first years of a league are rough, bro. They are rough. Sure. And you, you want to see it just keep surviving and keep surviving. And it looks like it's going to do so. They've done an excellent job of, I know you talked about it a little bit, Rick, like kind of the promotion and getting behind it. And then, you know, certain days, you know how, I guess, you know, from the media standpoint, and you can share with this, it's the biggest story of the day. Mm-hmm. You, you're always finding what's the story, right? Yeah. And you look up and see the biggest. It's, so the timing is, is impeccable. Uh, and even with, you know, kind of WNBA, uh, going on, I mean, you know, USA basketball kind of flirting with it. If it's not an an Olympic year, a huge timer for the big three. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, not to, it doesn't hurt that this is the difficulty that I have is whether it's Carmelo or it's Joe Johnson, um, when, when, and, and I see this from players like Isaiah Thomas for whatever kind of jumps up and jumps to mind because he's he said it a couple times and some other guys have said it it's this guy should be on an nba roster uh in part either because of what they're doing in the big three in the case of joe johnson or Melo, just because we know what he is as a scorer and i'm thinking come on guys like we got to be a little more nuanced than that does Melo have the talent to play in the league absolutely does he have the mentality to play the role that he could play in the league right now? That's a big question mark. And he's a big personality and a big talent. And there's a consideration there. Do you want to bring that in? I, I mean, I, I totally understand why there would be a question there. And it's even the same with Joe Johnson. I love watching. I've loved watching him play in the big three. I love the, like the smoothness. He just gets to wherever he needs to. But the bottom line is, you got to be able to defend your position too. And in watching the big three, he struggled defending in the big three. What do you think he's going to do in a full court game in the NBA? Like, are we not? And I wanted to get, you know, like I could cap on IT or whatever. And like, well, and I'll leave them, but I'm not, I'm going to leave that alone. But it's like, I would hope that guys in the league, respect and understand how hard it is to be in the league because they've done it and they understand the demand on both ends. Now, 
Are there politics? Absolutely. But to look at a big three contest or look at a guy and he can score and say, well, he should be in the league. It's like, you know this as well as I do, Ryan. There's so much more that goes into it than just pure talent. Like, there's plenty of, as, we, as, as Will Blackman and I say when it comes to, to talent in the NFL, there's a lot of four threes on the street. Like, there's a lot mm. of guys who are flat-out burners who mm. aren't playing in the NFL because they don't know technique. They can't, they can't remember uh, sets. They can't, they can't read uh, offenses. And it's the same That's with the, the NBA. Truth. It's the same with the NBA. You, like, it's, not, it's, it's not that simple. And it, and it distresses me when I see players who should know better who advertise it that way, as if there's some injustice being made. There's plenty of injustice in the NBA, but, you know, get it right. Because if you don't get it right, then everybody dismisses it, dis- dismisses the real injustices and, and, uh, and, and, and just says, oh, you're just complaining to complain or you, you don't know what you're talking about. That's where, that's, where, that's where it hurts me when I hear arguments made for things that it's like, Dude, you don't don't bark up that tree because it's you're not you don't have it right, and it's going to undermine everything else. So, with all that in mind, uh, with all that said, do you how do you feel about what Joe Johnson showed in the Big Three? Joe's always Joe. His game went that none of honestly for real none of that surprised me. I I fully agree with you when I when I look at him. I look at Melo. It's a it's a question of conditioning. I actually had a talk with Melo. I, he came to to the gym over here at CSUN, uh, out in Northridge. Uh, you know, about a week or so back, or well, shoot, actually before I left, and he he looked in great shape, man, the best shape normally. Because Melo, you know, no no shot or anything, he'll turn into a bit of a fat boy in the off season. Though, like his natural genetics are yeah. like husky. He's got to work. He's, he's got to work at keeping yeah, that weight. Yeah, down. and he was trim. He was trim and he looked good. And I said, man, shoot, you ain't shape, brother. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And you saw the news come out today that, uh, you know, Kyrie and KD are very interested in him right. coming over to the Nets. And he's worked out with those guys. So that wouldn't surprise me. And, I, you know, excellent fit if that that's able to work out. But, you know, he should he should be on a roster. I'm on that belief. And he said, look, man, I'm to the point where I'm willing to take anything. And I, and I think that that did take some humbling. Yeah. Uh, but also – it was very distasteful of how it happened in Houston. And what people don't realize is the way you're, because there are some guys who've been a little out of shape that get on rosters, but the way you kind of go out is different. Like Dwayne Wade, we all know Dwayne Wade, if he came back, right. Mm -hmm. If he said he wants to play, there are teams that would take him. hundred percent. And you would just know this is a 30 game season for him and for the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? You know that. Sure. And the way he was exited in Houston was just wrong, man. And it ended up, it paid paid off his career. And for me, 30, 34 right now, I can still be playing in the NBA. My my body's up to par. I jump, still jump high enough, still do that. It's not a question of if I can. It just doesn't make sense. But the way I was let go, I got waived right before the playoffs. And I didn't get to go into the playoffs. And that essentially niched my chances of playing in the league again because it looks like well why would you aid this guy well what people don't look at is that we had like seven big guys on rosters on roster and like five guards at the time five or six guards and it was like we have to have another guard and everybody else is on contract well ryan you're the most uh you're the simplest guy to get rid of most expendable you're the most expendable and so they let me go but for me that almost guaranteed my last year in the way that I was let go. Shoot, it was it just the way your season goes that after a certain age, you know, Doc Rivers killed my career the second year. I didn't play a minute after a certain point. You know what? And he didn't trade me. Do- and Doc's consensus- killed a couple careers. Like there's Doc's good killed, there's some Doc good in, in Doc and there's some not so good. And people yeah. don't always recognize the not good. He's Doc, he has yeah. killed a couple careers and yours isn't the only one. He will kill it. And it was hard. It was almost, I don't want to say like a favor, but it was like, hey, we remember you the year before Pete up in Sacramento. Like, hey, we remember, like, you can go. I don't know. I don't know why you didn't play more. And then I moved, stepped into dysfunction. So a lot of that, you've got to politic your way in the league. And for me, 
you know, I'll give you the grand mistake, which, you know, you live through it and it is what it is. But I told Pete I was committed to him in Sacramento and not to trade me, that I'm going to ride it out in the long haul for him. Hmm. And that was the general manager. And he doesn't trade me. And Griff wanted me with the Cavaliers. This is the year that LeBron takes Tristan Thompson, Mozgov, hmm. and those guys and Love and everybody got hurt to the NBA Finals. Yeah. Well, I think they trade for Mozgov. I would have been Mozgov. Yep. yep. Or at least on the team at that time. Yeah, and, and I Mozgov remember I remember late. that conversation at the time that uh that your na- you were in the mix to go there. Yeah, and it was that. like I you know, I was oblivious to all this and I'm telling Pete, no, keep me asking like, man, Pete, get me the heck out of here. Because guess what? Pete moves on to Denver. You think Pete was returning yeah. my phone calls in Pete free Del agency? Sandra. Yeah, that's my guy, but all that loyalty and, you know, I'm down with you and, you know, got my back. You're a good guy. You know, yeah, you know, man, please. Right. Please. So you you said before we, we I want to wrap up, I want to get to, to Marcus Cousins and his situation. But before we get to that, you said you could still be playing in the NBA, but it doesn't make sense at this point. What did you mean by that? Well, it doesn't make sense in the and we look at it twofold. They take two centers on roster right now, if that. They may take a, a true center and a hybrid. There may be one true center, if that, true. on each roster. Uh, and then the way that I went out of the NBA. And I wasn't a guy at you know, 32, 31 years old that was, how, how would I put it, Rick? That was like, hey, this guy's a dynamic scorer or he... You know, he's like right now to be a center, you got to be like top 15 in your position to be able to do certain things if you're of of an older age. Mm -hmm. And after a certain point, you're no longer potential. It's like we know what you are. And teams were going to the extent where they just say, hey, we'll get potential. Why would I sign Ryan Hollins, who may play or may not play, when I can go get a 22-year-old kid who could be cheap labor for me one day. And if he blows up, I have him on contract for the next five years. And he gives me the same numbers that Ryan Hollins gave me. Right. You know, so teams don't look at it, even though you may be better than some of these young guys, they don't see it as that. It's not a smart move for a team to make. And that young kid is going to go to summer league. He's going to play, you know, on the bench and he's going to do nothing but get better. Right. And I'm still figuring out what he is. So that's the battle. If you're an NBA player moving forward, the way the NBA is governed now, that if you're not in that top eight of the rotation or top nine, they're going young. And that's that's just the truth. And right. for Melo, I believe it was more a question of conditioning. And this isn't the older the NBA we grew up in where you kind of, hey, you played you played your minutes and then you, you know, you came and sat on the bench. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like you gotta be I just remember having to be very productive, bro, in a short amount of time. Yeah, right. And and that there's a, that's a skill. That's a, it takes a certain ability to be able to be that efficient in short minutes. And if you've been a volume shooter and you've always played big minutes, that can be an adjustment. And some guys can't make it. Some it's mm-hmm. it's it's hard or it's because you got to find a way to impact the game very quickly one way or the other. And if you're not doing it scoring wise, then you got to find another way to do it. And Mello for the for the most for the most part has never had to approach it any other way than I I'm I'm going to get buckets. It's he he will rebound. I think he I I mean I just go back to say it again. Oklahoma City could have been the perfect scenario for him if he had embraced the new role right away. He's got Steven Adams behind him. He's got de- de- defenders all around him. He's playing the four. He'd have to get in shape and be willing to do the dirty work of defending fours and, and defending on the block. But he was going to get a load of wide open threes on, in the trail position. And for whatever reason, he just, it wasn't the fit. He was worried about, you know, when he was playing and who he was playing with and how much he was playing. And it it just, it was... It took him a while, and it, and he probably woke him up. You know, and after Houston and OKC, it, it's probably come home. I just I'm not convinced that it's not too late. That, as you said, at this age, GMs and teams around the league are looking at it and saying, well, "We know who he is, and it's not worth the risk." So, uh, all that said, with Demarcus Cousins, uh, as of this recording. 
there is a, a warrant out for his arrest for domestic violence. Um, I don't know if you heard the video, the, uh, the audio clip is, uh, baby mama recorded him when they were having an argument on the phone about, uh, to co- uh, cousins was getting married to someone else, wanted his son with the baby mama to attend. She wouldn't let it happen. And, uh, he threatened to put a bullet in her head, uh, figure of speech, but nonetheless, uh, in this day and age, not something that you can say. Now, obviously this was a private conversation. It did make it out in the public. I, I'll leave it open to you before I tell you my thoughts on, on where this is. I, I hate to see it. It's not the first time we've seen it, but nonetheless, like, where do you, How do you look at this? Do you look at, hey, Cousins was done wrong? Do you look at it, he should have known better? He can't say stuff like, I mean, how do you, how do you, where do you come down on what this says about DeMarcus Cousins and, and, and the situation? Well, first off, I know DeMarcus, uh, he's a good guy. He has his days. And when he has his days, he has his days. I'm not going to say they're like anybody else. He has special type of days. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But the one thing I rest assured he wasn't going to do is go get a gun and go shoot the mother of his child. That said, Rick, you can't threaten people, and especially not in today's day and age, because there are those, well, well, we threatened you and we didn't do anything, and people go and they get shot. So that's actually a real offense. Yeah. And the the crime fits the punishment in this situation because you can't do that. Now, before anyone judges, and I'm I'm laying out facts here. I mm-hmm. do know DeMarcus. I do know he wouldn't do I'm laying out facts here, not things I'm guessing on. Uh I'll I'll set the table before somebody wants to judge. And this is my this is not my defense, this is my judge judgment. This is before you judge. I want you to give this give these perspectives. You know, was there a history of abuse? Because why would she feel entitled to record the conversation? Mm-hmm. How had Demarcus treated her? Um, why could his son be at his wedding? That's something that would enrage anybody, and could cause words from I don't care who you are to say something like that. I'm going to shoot you if my son can't make it because it just seems crazy. And I can't even say I'm beyond that. A situation like that would drive any man crazy, I I would imagine. And and I'm not saying that it's okay to do, but I I would say there could be a similar reaction. Uh, And DeMarcus has to know better, man. But he's in a situation where he's injured for the second time. He got married and his life is in this whirlwind right now. So, I don't want to say you got sympathize because we hey, look, man, everybody goes through some crap boogie. Right. Everybody goes through some crap, bro. And just welcome to the real world, unfortunately. But, you know, he's never known injuries like this. He's never been in this place in his life. And I would assume themes came and spilled out or maybe there had been a history of this. But I ultimately don't know. But I'm not OK with those actions uh, from him. But before you go judging, just make sure you see that whole perspective. Right. You know, why was she videoing him? Why couldn't the child go? Um, is she not happy for him to be married? Why not? You know, what was going on here? You know, we don't know that full story. True. And ultimately, the crime fits, you know, the shoe fits, the, the punishment, however you want to put it. That's a reality. Well, and this is where I don't like DeMarcus knows the answers to all those questions. And DeMarcus is getting married. Now, I understand where he is emotionally because of what you said. Like, this is, he's getting married. This is probably one of the first positive things that has happened in in recent time for him. And it's being disrupted because it's not going to be the way that he wants it, which is he wants his son there. At the same time, this is the woman that you had a child with that you're not putting a ring on it and you're inviting him, her, your son to your wedding to someone else. If you don't think that she's not going to be up in some feelings, 
then you're not cognizant of, of that. DeMarcus has to be aware that he's dealing with somebody who may not be feeling him getting married and is probably as full of emotion as he is. And so I know what he wants and I understand why he would want it, but you're dealing, you're dealing with somebody who's, who's has the po- the potential of de- reacting as emotionally as you have reacting emotionally. And yet you have more to lose. DeMarcus Cousins said, I don't know who this woman is, right? I don't know who she is, I don't, but everybody's going to know who DeMarcus Cousins is. Everybody knows who's going to, like, where that's going to go. And that's where he just, he had to be smarter about how he handled things. And so I agree with you. Like, the cut, the, the Marcus I know, I mean, you know, his, his tantrums and the times he's gone off, there, there's plenty of, pe- plenty of people around the league who will tell you, stories but do i think he's somebody who would actually take a gun and shoot somebody no i i i think he's i mean for all of his tantrums and all the stuff that he can do i still think he's more a big kid than he is anything else uh and but you know him you i i've known him over the years i've had a chance to spend some one-on-one time with him but you actually played with him so yeah you you have a you have an even deeper sense of who he is and what he's capable of, both on the good and the bad. Yeah, I, don't, I can't see it, but I mean, I you know, I haven't heard any like, oh, he's abusing his girl. Like, I I haven't seen that, you know. Right. So I I I don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't put it. You know, it's always like, oh, I never thought he would do that, but I I, I just don't see it. Well, above I, just, and, I just don't I don't see it. You know, above and I beyond that. It. How do guys, how do guys look at the baby mama drama that guys get into? Like, is there a feeling that, dude, if you're gonna be, you know, if you're gonna be running game, you're gonna have the, the, uh, the harem, uh, so to speak. Take care of your business. Don't let this spill out in the street. Or do guys look at it and go, you know what? It's just the price of living that life and having that you know, having that luxury of, uh, multiple women or whatever it might be. How do, is is there, is there a feeling like, Hey, be a pro, you know, you can, you can run game in a bunch of different places, but, but handle your business. Or is it, Hey, you know what? It comes with the territory. Sometimes things are going to happen. I don't think guys think it out, bro. Yeah. I don't think guys map out like, Hey man, they're thinking with the wrong head is basically what you're saying. Yeah. 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 I don't think guys map it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) But ultimately, I mean, I have... ultimately, they, I mean, who's advise? that would be one of the first things. If I'm an agent, if I'm a businessman, whoever it is, I'd be like, in fact, I, BJ Armstrong did this with some of his guys. He goes, you walk into the club thinking you're picking them out. He goes, they already got you they dialed up, you man. <laughs> they already know, they know what you make. They know where you, they know everything about you. They are gaming you. You're not the one that's running the game. And and you need to know that because you're the one who's got the most at stake. You have what they want. They might have something you want, but it ain't going to cost them what it could potentially cost you. And I'm just, I don't know. I, it, 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 I just think, well, young dude, you think you can get away with it? I guess so. I, I guess, I guess that's part of it. I, I was, I was I was a knucklehead to an extreme when I was in my twenties too. So I guess I can't I can't pull that card, but I just feel like making a guy understand what's at stake and here's the here's the here's the thing I'll I'll ask you. When you look at where DeMarcus is, you got three non contact injuries. Uh you, now you got this drama on top of it, which is not gonna help his you know, the the his avail or his, his the attractiveness of having him on a team. Uh, you think we'll see him in the NBA again? <sighs> this is tough, bro. Now the off the court thing. This is tough. I mean, this is because, worse than Dwight Howard. Well, a lot of this was the like revamp the image. Yes. And 
this deal might be the final blow because now you go, ah, where's the image at? Is he, ah, now I'm a little skeptical. Golden State helped the image. And you made the sacrifice. You were, you know, you did what you needed to do. I'll revamp you, the image. Let me tell you something, So though. this, this put they, it right back. <laughs> if they ever go talk, if anybody goes talks to guys on the Warriors, like gets the real, that image ain't going to be as solid as you think, I think it turned out to be. I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting that. But guess what? <laughs> <laughs> guess what? They protected him. Yes, they did. They, protect, oh, they protected they, they, they protected everybody. They protected, they protected, the protected KD. They protected him. Yeah. Yeah. When they, well, well, <laughs> you got anything when you say they protected KD? Talk well, to me. You, did you see the, the thing that he did? He did the, the, the thing with Chris Haynes from Yahoo? Where he said it was kind of his choice to play or what? Uh, uh, the, the whole thing. The way he described the whole thing, there was major drama, major drama. And I, this, I will say this: Chris Haynes and I both work with FS1. I like Chris. I think he, I think he's, uh, I think he's working hard to to make his name in, in the game. But Chris was around the Warriors. Chris knows that the story that KD told was not the whole story by a long shot he has to know that he's too good of a reporter not to know that so when you just put it out let it's just kd side of the story or you don't ask the questions that i know chris could have asked because you just want you want to be able to say you got kd i'll be honest that hurts all of us in the business it hurts all Mm. of us it hurts all of us in the business. There's a couple guys right now who are having a tremendous amount of success because they're playing the game. And as a result, it forces everybody to play a game that kills the integrity of reporting. And I don't, and you know, I, I, I feel bad that Chris is the only name that I'm mentioning because of this circumstance. And, and as I said, I, you know, he's, he's done a, He's gotten a lot of good scoops. He's got made a lot of great contacts. He's there's a lot of good work I think that he does. But this is one where if you're not willing to ask the tough questions or you're not willing to to share the other side of the story, then I think you're doing a disservice to all of us because now the sources out there are going to forum shop and they want to they'll find somebody who's just going to tell the story the way they want it told. And now that goes out there as if that's a complete story. And it's not. It's not. I can tell you that for a fact. What, it's not what questions would you have thrown out? Just give me one. <sighs> I would have asked him about the lack of communication between KD and the rest of the team. Why did he separate himself? Because Chris was there in the locker room. He knows that KD was a man on an island in that locker room. Uh, I would have said, tell me about the times that the Warriors called you in representation in to kind of figure out where your head's at. I would assume that Chris knows about those. Because I was told, I I had heard that there was one, and then somebody said, there was more than one and he didn't show up for it. He just had, uh, he had rich show up for it. There was a real separation between KD and the rest of the team. And they kept a lid on it. The, the work that Draymond and clay and Steph did to show the ultimate respect for KD all the way down the line to the very end when KD had distanced himself from everybody on that team, was it's, it's why they're champions. It's why I, I don't care what they do from here on out. I will always have the utmost respect because those guys never lost sight of we're trying to win this thing. And we don't care how KD's acting. If we think he can help us win, and we do, then we're going we're, we're gonna to protect our group. And we're not going to let out that there's, there's a fracture here. We're going to try to hold it together. 
We're going to hope he's going to come back. We're going to talk about it. We need the greatest player in the game. We need him with us. Like they, they did and said everything in spite of the fact that there, there had not been, there had been a cooling of the connection there for a good part of the season. So it's, it's that because, it, and, and you just, you just have to say, you know, based on being around the team, it didn't look copacetic. There was a lot of confusion. Like there was, even with the injury, there was a lot of confusion. Like, were you going to play? What happened in the, what happened on the three, you know, the three V three, just a lot of questions. And none of that was, none of that was brought up. So it was interesting to get KD's side of it. But man, when I was reading it, I was like rolling my eyes. I'm like, come on. So, all right, that does it for this episode of Buker and Hollins. So good to have you back, my man. I, and I know you're <laughs> glad to be back now after hearing about the whole Istanbul story. Yeah. Uh, by the way, so what? What? So we can look for the suit that is made out of the cloth that you bought in Istanbul. Describe it. Was it just one bolt? Did you get uh, multiples, or what? You what? What'd you get? I got. I got two of them. Okay. I got two. They're both blue. Different types of blue. Okay. So hopefully silky, we, shiny, I'll, light, not, nothing, dark. nothing real crazy, nothing real wild. They're okay. they're dark, but you know, kind of, uh, you know, um, square pattern. So you know. It'll, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot a, I'll shoot you a photo of it. It, it won't, nothing crazy. It won't, it won't stand out. You won't really notice. Okay. All right. One of the other things I want to get to very quickly, the Kobe Shaq beef rears its head once again uh, with a interview that Kobe gave. This is what it happens. It's, it's these corporate junkets or these appearances. I'm sure he got paid. Does this, uh, does it and does it thinking that, the media is not there, or maybe he doesn't care. But anyway, Kobe once once more went back to Shaq not being in shape. Says, I told him he wasn't in shape. And then, <laughs> of course, Shaq gets wind of it. And Shaq is saying, well, if you'd passed the ball, you'd had 12 championships, etc." They go back and forth. Uh, look, I, at this point, I don't really care. It's it's We know that those two were oil and water when it came to personalities and the way they approached the game. We also know that they were a dynamic duo that won championships. They were together eight, nine years. They were that's that's a that's a good enough run for anybody. That's longer than most marriages. So I don't have an issue with any of this. I have an issue that that Kobe can still say something like that. I guess this is what it comes down to. Kobe can still say something like that, and Shaq will still react to it. Like Shouldn't he be past it by now? Because he's because it's not like Kobe's not telling the truth. I think <laughs> I think Kobe's getting to that stage, like where he's just getting like older and just more candid. Just like, hey, he wasn't in shape. If he was in shape, we would have won. <laughs> like it was just candid. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And Rick, you know it. These are the dog days of the summer, so. Any other time that may have just blown over, like, oh, he know, said it. You don't, don't think so? I, 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 I don't think I, I it's think that you're big. right that, that the news cycle was slow. And so Very it slow. did garner a lot of attention. But I think Kobe Shaq beef will always, just like Kobe LeBron beef, any, like, those are evergreen. Those will, people will go back and ring that bell if they can. It's, I mean, I, look, I sided with Kobe's position on this at the time. And this is this is the one thing people don't understand about when Kobe and Shaq split up. It was Kobe had been hearing that, well, Penny or Vince Carter or Tracy McGrady, if if they had been in Kobe's position, they would have won three rings too. And Kobe was like, F that. Let me show you. I don't even need the big fella and I can win championships. And so Shaq seeing a shift in because it was it was Shaq and Kobe was the sidekick. He was Shaq was Batman and Kobe was Robin. 
and Kobe was ready to be Batman and Shaq to be Robin. And Shaq was like, we ain't changing that. <laughs> we're, not, we're not shifting that dynamic. So Kobe was like, and Kobe's hearing about how like, you know, Shaq's the one who won the championships. Okay, get Shaq out of here. Let me show you that I can do it. I can be the guy. And ultimately he did. He showed that he could do it. He won two more rings. So that's never going to die. I just, for all, and I, I will say this, I'm a little disappointed in Kobe backed off and then went to, he's still the most dominant ever. It's all love, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, I, I agree with that. It is. I think you guys come to appreciate what you did together, but the respect level is still not what they're professing it to be at least from Kobe's end. I think he really does think if Shaq had been as committed to the game as I was, we would have won more championships. And I think he's right. <laughs> this is the funny part where like, it wasn't even, this wasn't a, a shock to me. That's why, that's why I say it's just a slow part of the year. No. I've heard Shaq agree with Kobe on that same topic. Yes. I've heard Shaq yes. agree. Yes. And it's like, yo, that, that, that dude right there, he just different. He wanted more. I ain't, I ain't wanted the way Kobe wanted it. I've heard him agree. Right. <laughs> so, right. right. I mean, so that it goes back to my original point. It's like at this point, shouldn't Shaq have like, like for him to react the way he did? It's like, Shaq, come on. We all know it. To be, we're not taking anything away from you. You did what you did. Uh, uh, Shaq, you got to think, understand Shaq is an entertainer, bro. He's like, also. When me, and him, when me and him went back and forth on first take. Yeah. It's just entertainment. He gets yeah. entertainment. Yeah. He knows how to work it. He is. Dwight Howard, he don't really have a beef with Dwight Howard. It's just kind of like, oh, whatever. Like, But it's a perfect time to ride the wave. Boom. Go out and diss Dwight right now. Like, yeah. He knows how to ride the wave, man. Like, Think about it. Shaq hasn't been a good basketball player for what, the last, for 10 years? Yep. I mean, like, let's, let's stick, was it, was it Miami? Because it, it it wasn't Cleveland, Shaq. Like the no. last dominant Shaq Cleveland, was Boston. The, no, the last Miami, dominant Miami was two thousand six. The last time we saw Shaq, like yeah. Shaq, Shaq, like yeah. yo, I don't want to guard that dude. Like yo, yeah. have have twenty fouls on your bench for right. for him right. was Miami. But right now in two thousand and nineteen, this man is a relevant, strong as relevant name. He hasn't gone away. And he's bigger than his play on the court, off the court. He understands that game, and he and I love it. And he works it. He's gold, bro. He is you. you Col Shaq is gonna win the life game. I, Kobe I won the basketball game. Shaq has won the life game. And I, I bring that up, Rick. I see you're making a face at me. I bring that up because that's what Shaq is doing. He can. He can make himself continue to be relevant. He can have the debate with Kobe, but the it's the way he reacts. He reacts like he's still ultra sensitive to the accusation. When, as you said, he's already conceded it. Like there, yeah, there's there's a way it. there's I mean, a way to just, keep he's a, just stirring it. He's just stirring it. Yeah. Wouldn't you, res wouldn't you respond, though, if his, Kobe, his even though we know it, if Kobe, like, if he was out, he out of shape, I respond. Right. What course he going to respond? Would it, he responds. Hey, if had his stuff together, like, yeah. He responds and makes it personal. He takes it personally. That's what makes the distinction between, no, 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 between no, no. Shaq the is, entertainment no, no. and taking it personally. No, I don't, I don't agree. Shaq is too good, Rick. Shaq is too good. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I'm not He's so too sure. good. I'm not so sure. All right. Uh, in the next podcast, oh, by the way, um, DJ Tony, I promise you, the Kobe Air Force Ones are on the way. I need to find the right box to send them. It sounds crazy, but I, I need to find the right box to send them <laughs> to you. They're on the way, I promise. If you want to be like DJ Tony and you want to uh, receive gifts from Buker and Friends, uh, review our show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and then screenshot that review to at Buker Friends 
and you will be eligible. Next podcast, I will be rejoined by Will Blackman. We will get into Zeke still holding out and looks like Jerry is cutting out the agent in the equation. We'll get into on the eve of uh, NFL starting and with college football gearing up what Will is seeing and what we like. That will all be in the next podcast. And we are going to get back to a regular three times a week. We've got advertisers who are demanding it, so we're going to make it happen. Uh, In the meantime, as always, thanks for